So hey, everybody watching, uh, welcome for tuning in to WonderCon at Home. I'm Peter Kleins, this is the Writer's Coffee House. Uh, quick intro for those of you who haven't seen me do this before. Uh, the Coffee House began many years back on the East Coast. A writer named Jonathan Mayberry was teaching classes with a couple other members of the Writer's Club. Uh, and then afterwards they would, you know, go out and a couple students would follow along and, you know, just to grab a drink, grab a coffee, whatever. And then three or four students were following along with follow-up questions, unrelated questions, that sort of thing. Uh, then seven or eight students were following along, and then 10 or 12, and then the whole class was going out for coffee and drinks afterwards. And they realized everybody was getting as much out of this sort of informal sitting around talking thing as they were out of the actual lecture in class. Uh, and that was the start of the Writers Coffee House. There are now 17 of them, I believe, scattered all over the country. Uh, I generally run the one in Burbank, California, in Los Angeles, at a wonderful store called Dark Delicacies. Uh, and I sometimes fill in for Jonathan in San Diego at another wonderful store called Mysterious Galaxy. Um, as you can kind of guess, this is not really the format that the coffee house was intended for, but we asked you all for a bunch of questions and got some, and I have a bunch of friends here who are about to introduce themselves and- we Friends, will... just let's be clear there. Just be clear, just friends, no benefits at all. <laughs> Uh, and just in case God knows I've you, gotten nothing out of it. <laughs> and just in case uh, some of you don't know me, I am Peter Kleins. I'm the author of the X Heroes books, uh, 14, The Fold, Paradox Bound. My new book, Terminus, just came out as an Audible exclusive a little while ago. I'm a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and I have been writing one way or another uh, pretty much since I was about nine years old, uh, successfully now supporting myself entirely through writing uh, for 12 years now. So. And you can tell just how much of a toll that's taken on him because he's actually only 15. I am. I, the past six years have been brutal. Okay. Somebody else talk. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm going to say something. Uh, I'm Stephen Blackmore. I am the author of the uh, Eric Carter Necromancer Urban Fantasy Series. Uh, the fifth book is actually... By the time this airs, it's probably going to be out. It comes out uh, April 28th. And I've written uh, a lot of tie-in fiction, uh, gaming, uh, just bits and pieces of, of different things, short stories, all that. So um, not nearly as accomplished as Peter. I am, I am not a New York Times bestseller. So he just lords that over all of us. That's why he invited the rest of That's us. That's why he is just, just so you can say, oh, by the way. <laughs> anyway, that's me. So, Robin, how about you? Hi. Um, I'm M.L. Brennan. I'm the author of the Generation B Urban Fantasy series. I'm not a New York Times bestseller either. <laughs> I'm really sorry I brought it up, Okay. <laughs> Oh, geez, Peter, if I, if I was a New York Times bestseller, you'd see a banner across my, uh, my wall. Hey, like, oh, for, for like thing. 10 minutes, yeah. I was a bestseller on Apple Books. That's actually pretty for good. For a four-year-old yeah. book because they dropped the price to 99 cents. That's pretty good. I'd probably I'm okay that. with that. That's really good. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I, I have an urban fantasy series. It was published through Rock, which is, you know, part of uh, Penguin uh, Random House. So, yeah, so that's why I can talk about publishing. Christy. My turn. Um, yeah, so I'm Christy Cherish, and I'm from Canada, and I'm in Canada right now. Um, I, I, you know, I shouldn't gang up on Peter and also say that I'm not a New York Times bestseller, but I'm not a New York Times bestseller. Um, and, uh, in case you were wondering. So, this in case you were wondering. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm Canadian, and um, I'm sort of in a, a, I'm also an urban fantasy author. Um, I also did a PhD up at the University of British Columbia in cell biology and genetics. So I guess that's sort of my oddity in writing. Um, okay, hang and on. Which one pays worse? The PhD. <laughs> the research. Amazing. I get that question all that's, the time. That's terrifying. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So um, <laughs> anyway, 
I'm also an urban fantasy author, and I've got two series, um, Owl in the Japanese Circus with Simon and & Schuster, and um, uh, Kincaid Strange, uh, the Voodoo Killing series with Random House uh, and Random House Canada. And I'm kind of in an odd position because even though I'm in Canada, the U.S., of course, is the largest um, publishing uh, market and industry in the world. So, and because we're kind of sound similar and right similar, us Canadians publish in the American stream. So, yeah, so that's, um, that's, those are my credentials. Okay. Well then, um, shall we get started then? With our no. Let's! No, let's just forget the whole thing. On second thought. Let's talk On about second thought. Let's ask Christy really hard-hitting questions. Christy, why don't you make us call you doctor? That's a good question. It's kind of a cultural thing. So oh. we just, we don't. Like, I mean, for, first off, it's not a research industry here. Like, I'm, I'm, like, I always, met, like, I mentioned I'm a geneticist to, you know, when it comes up in conversation. I, I mentioned cell biology and stuff. But to sort of walk in and say, I'm Dr. Cherish. Um, it doesn't, it's not really applicable to the writing industry, um, because yeah, you're not totally a New York different... Times bestseller, for example. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So Christy, it, I totally kind of... would make people do that. I mean, I have a terminal master's degree and if there was any title attached to that, I would literally make people call me that all day long. <laughs> <laughs> the next, the next American conference that I come down to just for you, I will make everyone introduce me as Dr. Cherish. That would make me so happy. <laughs> I'm going to make sure everyone introduces me as bachelor's degree in Peter Klein's. <laughs> An educated okay. pro, Mr. Stephen Blackmore. Bachelor. <laughs> ML Brennan. Um, MFA. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's, let's go over some of these questions, shall we? Questions for the panel? Um, so I got, we got a question from Roma. Uh, I've heard conflicting info re multiple submissions. Uh, some people say it's okay because you can draw, withdraw the other submission if you get accepted, while others say no, absolutely not. What is your take? Well, what is your take? And the first question goes to you, Stephen Blackmore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, say, I say submit it all over the place as much as you possibly can. Oh, uh, there's no, there's, there's nothing stopping you. There's nothing, uh, if one person comes back and says, hey, yeah, I want, you know, I want this, uh, great. If three people, even better. Uh, yeah, I think, I think just shotgunning it out there is, is a better idea than, you know, doing it piecemeal. That said, making sure that you're actually, you know, getting the, um, getting the right audience. Um, if you're writing a horror novel, don't send it to a nonfiction publisher. You know, <laughs> I mean, things like that. But yeah, I would, I would say don't, uh, don't hang on to it. Just, just get it out there. I think this actually depends on what you're writing. Because if you're writing short stories and you're writing books, different, there are actually kind of different rules in place for both those. Like if you write a book and your agent is sending it out, it's actually really expected that they're going to be sending it to a lot of different publishers at once, trying to get them to start bidding against each other. They actually expect multiple submissions in book publishing. Short story can have kind of some weird different rules. I think it's stupid to only submit to one person at a time anyway, because first of all, it might take you like seven or eight months to hear back from a, uh, a magazine and sometimes they, yeah and often that answer is just like no and it's like great I waited seven or eight months for that form letter no but I waste a lot of time so I would I always did multiple uh, simultaneous submission and I ran into it a couple times where it was accepted at a place and I literally had to send letters out to everyone else saying uh, thank you so much for your time and consideration but it has been accepted you know, for publication elsewhere. And invariably, I got very lovely letters back saying, hey, congratulations, we're really happy for you. Good for you. And this was actually even in places that had 
please don't simultaneously submit in their like stuff. Like everyone kind of understood that if you're doing it one at a time, you can literally spend years shopping around a single story and still only get through like half a dozen magazines. That that hurts. I just yeah. hurts to hear. It does, does it? When you think about when you add up all that live time. So diff I think that it's kind of like you have to look at what are is what's accepted practice in what you're submitting. Like are you submitting like um you know a co you know a cozy mystery book? Are you submitting a nonfiction like serious biological study by Dr. Sharish? <laughs> you know? Um, different rules are actually gonna apply. But I mean, there, there are a lot of, you have to know the rules in essentially the pool you're playing in to a degree. Yeah. I think like multiple submit. Yeah. The, when I, ver when the very, when I first started writing, um, I ran into this thing with short stories at conventions. So sort of local writers conventions where there was almost this militant, word of mouth that, oh, you can't submit short stories, uh, particularly in sci-fi, mm -hmm. uh, to the same, to, to, you know, to different publishers at the same time. Um, you'll get blacklisted and they really don't like it and they all know. And once I started meeting and talking to professional authors, including short story authors, um, of course, that's like your experience, uh, you know, Brennan, it's, it's not really the reality of it because as, as you pointed out like you could be sitting there for seven months on one story waiting to hear no and then submit to the next magazine and it's another six or seven months to hear back no um so you know everybody who seems to be prolific in short stories is actually submitting to multiple magazines at the same time and of course for agents as well oh. um you're always submitting to multiple agents at the same time. I think when I first started out, I submitted, I would do like 20 on a weekend and I'd send out those same. emails and then I'd do another 20 and then another 20. And the only thing that you have to be aware of is once, even once you have somebody ask for the manuscript, they might ask for an exclusive on the full manuscript, but that's still not saying that you shouldn't be submitting to agents and sending out your query letter still because they haven't offered representation um and all they've asked is you know could you let me know if anybody else requests the whole ma manuscript so yeah absolutely simultaneous um submissions I, th I think the only thing and i think all you kind of touched on this is i i would actually i would go a little against what steven said and, and shotgunning it out there and maybe being a little more selective because you don't want to just send it to every single person you can. Don't like, you know, go through Raylan. And it's your mailman. You yeah, know, exactly. The dog sitter. Every, every email address you've ever had, would you like oh, to please? Oh, yeah. um, be more selective about who you are. And, and right there, that's going to winnow it down immensely. Like, if, Yeah, don't send it to your cousin or your mom. You know, that cuts it down. Mm hmm <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, but, it's like having like your wish though, list. Like, like, how, like how here are my top ten. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm gonna send it all my top ten. Once like half of them have said no, now here's my top twenty. Exactly. As, a, as opposed to, yeah. As a, as opposed to, I have you know I have found every fiction publisher that I can, and I'm sending it to everybody on the off chance Harlequin really wants my sci-fi horror story hey you never you know. know you probably do in some yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for these purposes you do <laughs> so who's, who's got another question i think we we handed, uh, it. We yeah. handed a bunch of yeah this question is from carrie this is how long and how many failures did it take before you got published <laughs> I'm sure we have all have lots of fun stories Too about many. this one. Let's, let's start with Christy this time. Okay, so I want to preface this with um, no publishing journey is the same, and there are no hard and fast rules. Christy, you, you got published the first try. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I didn't know that. <laughs> So, every author, 
author has a totally <laughs> different pathway to success. Um, what happened to me was I had tried, I, it's not, not that I got published on my first try. I was trying to write short stories and everything I wrote as a short story got just rejected. And so I was writing my PhD at the same time. Um, and I was splitting it between half PhD and half writing my fun novel because the fun novel was more fun. Um, and uh, by the time I was ready to defend my, um, you know, my dissertation, uh, I also had a novel, uh, you know, an adventure novel to shop around. So um, I started shopping it. Uh, it was the first novel I'd ever written. So I started shopping it around to agents, assuming I'm not going to get anybody um, who wants this novel. And I think about my 15th query letter, uh, I got an, I got an accept, like I, I, I got a, a request for the full manuscript. And then we had it sold by the end of the summer. So, which was a little insane. So the first nobody listened to Christy. We, nobody. Yeah, <laughs> nobody listened to me. It's a Canadian thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to be quiet right. now. <laughs> Christy's story of trials. <laughs> She's over there, you know, just, yeah, I'm, I'm raking in money. It's just, it's just, Backing up the money truck from all this too. Okay, well, I, I can go to the other extreme with this. Um, I, I've been, like I said, trying to do this for ages. I got my first rejection letter when I was eleven, um, and for this is this is for Comic Con, so a lot of people know this. I actually tried submitting a comic script to Marvel Comics, and not knowing any better, I sent it to the editor in chief, who at the time uh, was Jim Shooter. Um, and, and many people will be shocked by this, but I actually got back a very nice personal letter, uh, from a guy who very clearly understood he was writing back to an 11 year old. Uh, and I, and I can assure you the story was very clearly from an 11 year old. <laughs> um, uh, and then I got rejected a lot more and then I got into short stories and got rejected more. And then I wrote a novel in college which I never quite finished. And then I got out of college and wrote the after college novel and finished that one eventually and got rejected. Um, and then I started writing another book. There was also like a, a five year period in there when I focused on screenwriting because I was in Hollywood. Um, and I finally sold my first novel, which was my, my second comp 100% completed novel, my probably, in all fairness, fourth attempt at a novel. Um, and that is the one that sold for me. So I, I can probably point at a solid 25 years of rejection, <laughs> unlike Christy. <laughs> I, I should preface that. That is my <laughs> novel that got accepted. All my short stories that I ever tried to Yeah, those published. don't matter. Nobody cares. Nobody Christy, cares. Christy, you're trying to dig out of a hole. Give it up, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I think there's um, a, a part, uh, a question in this that isn't being asked. That is, um, and I don't know how to, how to phrase this, but. When, when do you? discourage stop yeah when you stop you know with with yeah being coming kind of, just getting so like screw this you know i i am done and um i remember i i was on a sort of an email uh ring with some other authors this is years and years ago i i had a uh, first book finally got an agent with it and it was out being shopped okay and it's been like six months and I'm bitching in this email chain about, Oh my God, it's six months. At what point do I just stop? Do I just say, Hey, you know what? Cut the losses, walk away. I'm done. And I get an email from one of the other guys saying, yeah, you know, I get that. I've been thinking about that too. Mine's been out there for six years. And I went, okay, I'm the here. I get it. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, a very real thing about being discouraged and going, I, I can't do this, or maybe I can. And, you know, you just keep doing it. Um, you know, 
Peter, you, just your experience getting with with acceptance and rejection, and so and we all have well, all we all have rejection stories. Um, some are more colorful than others, but you know, we all where I think we all ask that question: um, When do I stop? You know, at, at what point do I just say to hell with this? And I don't know if I actually had much to add to that, but just kind of pointing that out. So don't get discouraged, kids. Stay in school. Whatever. If you stay in school, don't do drugs. you get a PhD like Christy, and then you get a book contract because that's how it works. It's that simple. Yeah. There, I actually, there was... I actually have one story to add to this one. Oh, I think Stephen's uh, takeout just arrived. Um, I, th I actually have a fun uh, thing to kind of build off of Stevens, who's gone, <laughs> because um, I was kind of in that, <laughs> yeah. I was kind of in I'm that, working on it. <laughs> oh, we're still recording, yeah, Go yeah, on. we're still recording, there we are, this is, okay. this is, this is going to be the most exciting WonderCon panel ever, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I was, um, I did short stories like Christy did at first, and I had I had uh, I, you know, I had some success. I had some mixed success with that. Um, I did you know I got a bunch published. Uh, you know enough to get into an MFA program, which is you know its own story. But I came out of the MFA program and I had my literary fiction novel, which is very. It's about grief. Aren't so, they all? The Red Sox, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding about that one. So anyway, so I had that book, and I had spent a while on it. So I said, okay, good. I've got a complete manuscript here. I'm going to get an agent. And, you know, I spent about six months sending, you know, all my letters out. I, you know, really scorched earth my way through uh, a good list of agents. And I got some responses. I got some interest. I got some feedback. I rewrote the book. With the rewritten book, I got an agent in my second, you know, round. Uh, so then I had my literary fiction agent. So then she starts shopping my very quiet literary fiction book of sadness, grief, and the Red Sox around publishers. Is that what it was called? Sadness, grief, and the Red Sox? Pretty close. That's not a bad Pretty title, close. actually, in a way. I mean, that's better for than literary fiction, title. especially. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of cancer in that book. So anyway, so she's trying to sell a lot of sadness, a lot of death. But, uh, oh yeah, my god, just, there uh, are at least two suicides. I mean, it has only everything two? That a great American novel should have. So, so she's trying to so she's trying to sell this book, and in the meantime, you know, I've spent a lot of time with this book, and I say to myself, you know, she's working on selling this. I'm sure it'll sell. Uh, yeah, this will be great. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to do something fun and a palate cleanser, and I'm going to write a vampire book. Because <laughs> what vampires need are to be based on ticks. Because that's how I think. <laughs> does say a lot about you. It, it says a lot of accurate things about me, actually. <laughs> I think it's awesome that you wrote, you, you decided I need to write a vampire book and basically wrote a book about, like, politics and and rent and legal contracts <laughs> yeah. and actual obligate sanguivores yeah I... <laughs> yeah that was a fun piece of research uh so anyway so i had so i'm writing this thing literary fiction book i know this is going to shock you it did not sell at all <laughs> so i basically then i go to my agent who is a very serious literary fiction agent and i say well that didn't work. Um, can I interest you in my urban fantasy vampire book? And she's long pause. All by a dial tone. Clearly has never like been asked this kind of question before. She's like, well, I like your writing. So let's try. It. So, so, so I send it over to her. She looks it over and she's like, I guess we can try and sell this. Seems fun. So where should I send it? 
just a high comfort. <laughs> that is not something you want to hear from your agent. It was not a comforting thing, but she was, at that point, I had an agent in hand. So I was like, we can do this. So I go to my bookshelf and I literally start putting, pulling down similar books and saying, well, Rock publishes these. So-and-so publishes these. And she's making a list. Like, oh, okay, okay. So there's a list. <laughs> So she sends it to this short list of six, like the big six at the time. And, and, and they took it. So we sold it within a month. And that was the start of what was a very interesting experience for her. Out. <laughs> so funny. And I mean, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Isn't that amazing? But I mean, but in order to write the book that got published, I did have to, in a large way, kind of detach from the first book that I spent a lot of time on and put a lot into. That to a degree, you have to at times set things aside and say, let me try something else and just either clear my head or I'm going to try something else rather than kind of keep on this other one that maybe needs a rest or that, you know, maybe I need to kind of let sit and stop really following this all the way down. So, yeah, there's a lot of disappointment in publishing. and Sometimes there are some hard choices. But ultimately, I think it's one of the nice things about it is it's probably one of the few professions where you can really do it till you're dead, yeah. basically. There's, you know... It doesn't matter how unsexy we start looking. We can still write. So, Some of our cases have always looked. I've always, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Very few people say, oh, I don't know. You're too old to get into this writing business. I mean, <laughs> we, we need a young ingenue for this. <laughs> I was quick, quick thing for, for everyone here. 38 when I sold my first novel. Christy? Uh, if you don't 30, mind, what you Yeah, I'm just thinking. Um, 2015, I got to work back because I've stopped remembering. After 40, I stopped remembering how old I was turning. Um, Steven, pressure. 40. 30, 35-ish, 36. I was 29. So I beat Christy on one thing. <laughs> but I was so happy because literally... I was like, my God, for another three months, I actually could be put on a 30 authors under 30 list. <laughs> Such were my there, That's, yeah. <laughs> you could still put that on your website and, and on your, you know. We could just make up a website that said you were one of the 30 under 30. <laughs> I think that would have to be the 40 under 40 and I'm, I'm running out of time on that one too. <laughs> Others who are not dead. <laughs> New question. <laughs> okay, the, the, this I got this one right. Think so. Yeah. Yes. Coming yeah. from Matt, can you explain the writer agent publisher relationship? At what point should you look at getting an agent? Finally, do you need to wait till you have finished a novel to start the process? Last question first. Yes. Yes. Finish the novel. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, just really quick, for anybody watching this who has finished a novel and is, or is close or whatever, um, you, you wrote a novel. Congratulate yourself. If nothing else, you did something that the vast majority of people will never do. Yeah. Even, even the people I, I talked to, uh, Jocelyn, a couple of years back, I got to talk with a writing coach named Drusilla Campbell, and her whole thing was that only... And I think this is probably kind of true still, even with the rise of self-publishing and all, but only one out of 10 people who talk about writing actually do anything. Only one out of 10 of those actually finish their book, like a first draft of their book, and only one out of 10 of those actually get published. So if you've actually finished your book, write off your one out of 100. Out of 100 people who like to call themselves writers, you're one out of 100 right there for finishing. Um, to answer the rest of the question, 
I'll jump, I'll dive in and you can take this one. Um, the, the best way I think to describe the writer, agent, publisher thing, um, you're the writer, you're the artist. The publisher is the big times before, some of you might have heard it. There's a Richard Matheson quote that, Writing is art. Peter, Publishing you may, is you may want to back up. That art as possible. You may want to we back up because you fro your yeah. your image and recording it froze oh, and, oh. and so Wonderful I know editor. it was brilliant. <laughs> Whatever you said was absolutely brilliant. But could you do it, it again? Was, and I can't recapture it. It uh, so ephemeral. <laughs> Richard Matheson quote that uh, writing is art. Publishing is selling as many copies of that art as possible. Publishing is the business half of it. Um, your agent is your business partner who's your go-between, so you don't have to worry about the business. Um, it's basically just a huge relief. I sold my first four novels without an agent. Um, there were contract issues that I didn't even realize till later. One of the great things about having an agent, I don't have to worry about any of it. Your agent is the one who will go in and, and fight for you contract-wise, business-wise. You don't have to deal with any of those headaches. Um, that's basically the thing. Your agent is sort of your ultimate go-between. It's not saying you never have to talk to your publisher. Um, I have a really good relationship with the editors at Audible who I do stuff with. I have a really good relationship with the editors at Random House that I do stuff with. I talk to them all the time. But it's also really nice that every now and then you just sort of step back and let David, my agent, step in and say, so by the way, <laughs> Pete's a little upset about this. Or, you know, we were hoping we could do this. Or, depending, Pete needs more time. <laughs> That's my take. Yeah, that, that is the really nice thing about the agent relationship is, first of all, you know, your agent, uh, the way that the system should work is your agent gets paid when you do. They get a percentage of the money that you get. So therefore, it's in the agent's best interest to make sure you get the best contract possible because that's the most money for that agent. So there's an incentive mm -hmm. for the agent to be doing their best job for you because you should never pay a penny directly to your agent. Oh, they God, get no. a cut of... No. What the publisher gives you, your you know, your signing amount, your royalties, your agent gets an X amount cut of that. So they don't see money until the day you do. And they don't get any money until you get money. So that's kind of what keeps that relationship kind of balanced. And there, there are pluses and minuses to those relationships, and sometimes they don't work out. But I when the relationship is working the way it should, your agent is, first of all, they're your advocate. And second of all, they're your heavy. That they get to go in and have really tough conversations with the publisher like, no, we need more money or more author copies. Or I have found this thing in the contract and that's shenanigans because I know what a contract means. And you, the author, just get to sit there back there kind of like, yeah, my agent's working it out. Can't wait to work with you, editor. Uh, so you get to <laughs> sit over there and just have a nice kind of creative relationship with your editor while your agent is there like, yeah, you know, actually going over like, we should get more money. I'm going to make <laughs> give us more money. You know, that kind of thing. And so it's a really nice relationship. I really, it would be nice if we had agents for a lot of things in our lives. You know, like you ne you'd never have to go in and ask your boss for a, uh, a um, a raise, you'd say, um, I'd like you to talk with my representative, you know, Doreen. Doreen, please. You know, I'm going to step outside. <laughs> you know? So that's the relationship that you have with your agent. Once you have your book, and, and again, this, this can be different in different genres and different kinds of writing. Poets never have agents because they're poets. Um, no. Is that is that a sick burn? I can't tell. I I never read poetry. Oh, it I, it is a harsh harsh burn if you've ever been in a master's writing program. I, I actually uh, know a poet, and he doesn't have an agent. <laughs> I I 
I have heard rumors of poets with agents, but yeah, I, I, I don't think I've I don't think I've actually seen one in the wild. The poet laureate probably has an agent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they get that as part of the poet laureate package. I mean, it, it's tough. To, it's tough life being a poet. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, that's why they like reading so much. Ooh, ooh, I just did it again. Um, <laughs> so anyway, there are no poets who are going to be watching this. So I'm going to get so many angry you are, poets. Yeah, I'm going to get angry. You're going to. You're going to get angry poems. Angry that's what poems. you're going to get. Super <laughs> angry haikus coming your way. Oh, so vicious in their subtle use of language. So, yeah, so uh, nonfiction you know, writers are different. Generally, um, if you're going to be going traditional publishing, you really ought to have an agent if possible. Uh, once you complete your book, then you go through the agent hunt. Once you get an agent, then the, you and the agent will start working on trying to get a publisher together. Um, simply because trying to get an agent after the publisher, you can, you can end up stuck in some pretty weird contracts because those contracts are, they're really something that you want someone who knows what they're looking at to look at because there can be very strange language in those that can really screw you over. So, and you know, again, you know, the agent gets 15% of what you got. So you're not going to have to worry about paying them up front or paying them any money you don't have because they, they get money when you get it. So that's kind of how a lot can go. You can go straight to the hopscotch straight to the publisher in traditional publishing. And obviously self-pub has its whole different group of rules. But that's kind of where I see it stacking up. Yeah, and, and even if you go through uh, just straight to the publisher, like for example, Tor, and I think this was Sherry Priest, who's a huge uh, oh. steampunk author, who submitted, um, I'm pretty sure I'm not misquoting this, because uh, I watched her give a talk year, uh, five or six years ago now, and she talked about submitting to Tor, and she talked about them wanting the manuscript, and then they also said, you need to go get an agent. Um, because we would rather deal with an agent uh, who understands the contract, um, you know, the, the contract language and the contract process, and then gave her some space to go and do that. Um, I'm fairly sure that was Sherry Priest, because I think she was talking about a steampunk novel, but... It sounds like Sherry, yeah. I, yeah. I would hold on to that, because you, you said something, Robin, earlier that made me think of this. Um, uh, big red flag there have been some publishers i know this has gone around who adamantly say they will not deal with agents and oh, yeah. if there's a, a publisher small press mid press whatever yeah who says no we will not deal with you if you have an agent run oh, run yeah yeah. yeah yeah that that, that so. that's that it's it's i can't even I, I, if given time, I could think of the dating equivalent of that red flag, but it's a big red mm -hmm. flag. Like someone shows up with lizards at the restaurant. You know, th th that's not a good sign. It's that. Maybe someone who like starts talking about kids on the first date. Oh, yeah. You know, also, the, yeah. eating babies, things like that. Yeah, naming that the kids. Naming the kids on the first date. <laughs> then eating. Stephen, do you have thoughts, agents, all that? Uh, yes, I think they're a great idea. I actually switched agents recently. <laughs> um, I had, uh, <laughs> you know, nothing but good things to say about my previous agent. It's just that his focus really wasn't the direction that I saw my writing going. And uh, so I was able to get a, a new one um, and I'm with uh, Jabberwocky now. And that's been great. Uh, you know, I, I think that the relationship, and it's, it's been different because um, my current agent is, is much more proactive. And, and that's one of the, that's one of the, the benefits I think of having not just an agent, but a good one is they aren't just looking out for you, but they're actively looking for uh, issues in the contracts or just, Hey, I heard about this thing over here. Are you interested in this? And so on. 
Um, and not that my previous agent didn't do things like that. He just had a very different focus. And so a lot of those opportunities didn't show up. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, the, uh, the agent writer publisher relationship, um, the agent is the go between is, is uh, has worked out really well for me. Yeah, that's, and I think that's Stephen all I have to say. Stephen brought up something really good there too. Um, if you're not happy with your agent relationship for whatever reason, it is a contractual relationship. You can say, "Hey, I want us to decouple, and I'm going to go seek other agents." I mean, it's easier than breaking up with someone because it's actually kind of uh, you know everyone kind of understands the ground rules going in. I did eventually um, make the decision to leave my literary fiction agent much though I love her and I do owe the publishing of that book to her we did eventually reach the point where I realized I probably should find someone who knows this field it helps it helped. bless her she was ready to retire soon anyway it really did work out for both of us that's probably a good thing right there that if you I mean obviously the question was asked I think with the idea of if I'm looking for an agent I, do I need an agent? Whatever. Um, your agent is your business partner, your your partner. They are going to be co-signing contracts with you. They are going to be, you know, representing you in many things. Um, don't, just because somebody, you know, an agent comes to you, don't dive at them like, oh, thank God, finally an agent. Make sure this, it's somebody who's right for you. Make sure it's someone you feel comfortable with. Um, I, I mean, I can't speak for everyone. My agent actually to sort of prove his worth worked for me as my agent for free for four months. Like he set up our entire first book deal just on his own to prove he could do it and prove he was like a good agent for me. So I mean, I'm not saying every agent's going to do that um, with no paperwork, with nothing, but make sure it's someone you feel good about if you're getting an agent. So, cause you are, making a legal partnership with them yeah you can't you know you can't be so eager like i'm i because it's hard when you've been trying so long and you're like i can finally get published you're we're all so focused on that goal but we always have to kind of step back and say wait is this the right person is it the right place in the same way that you have to be really careful and you have to scrutinize your publisher as in is this person actually a good business publisher? Will they stand up to their obligations? Are they paying royalties? Because I mean, I, mm -hmm. everyone's seen the, you know, the writers beware on SIFWA. I mean, there are some really bad actors out there. You have to check out your agent too and not just fall over yourself at the first person. Now, that's why the querying can also be helpful because when you're going to them, you've done some legwork and you've said, okay, okay this person seems legit. But if something is striking you as, this person saying things that make me uncomfortable or I don't think we're going to work well together. You always have the right to say, no, there will be someone else. Jen, you know, I mean, unless you've written the worst book in the world, there will always be someone else. But that brings up other issues. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's also like, as you point out too, it's, um, there's that idea too. If you might start off as a literary writer, and then you move into a completely different genre. You could be doing military romance or science fiction, Tentacle. opera, tentacles, you know. And your agent who sold your first novel might not later on be a good fit for whatever you happen to move Lovecraftian into. Lovecraftian whodunit cozy fiction. There you go. So that would be I'm writing that one down. Yeah. <laughs> I've already got dibs on that market. <laughs> work, work, work in the Amazon algorithm. What do we got for other questions? I think we're like a little more than halfway through right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're at Christie's. I'm, yes, we're at Christie's questions. So, uh, so JAP's question uh, was actually, he says a few questions. Uh, how would you submit work to a publisher? How much sh should you submit? And how do you protect your IP, so your intellectual property, during the process? Well, first you you wrap it around a brick, and you throw it in the window. Um, right, hard. There, there first, are, you have to stalk their home. 
There are billions of ways to do it wrong. Take pictures of their pets. Never that, do that. <laughs> do that. Works every time. Um, <laughs> well, with the with the puppy for a walk the other day. <laughs> uh, protecting your IP. Couple of things on that. Um, once you've written it, you own the copyright. Uh, if somebody says, "Oh, hey, I've," you know, they they go and they publish it without you. Um, well. You can prove, hey, yeah, I, they stole it because here's my manuscript. Um, and another thing, and this comes up a lot, is I don't want somebody to steal my idea. Mm. And I, I, I hear that constantly. Um, nobody is trying to do that uh, because ideas are, I guarantee, you know, all four of us have probably had the same exact idea and written something based on that idea uh, and is completely different and unrecognizable to each other. Mm -hmm. um, it comes down to how are you going to implement it? Uh, and, that's where, and that's where things get unique. Um, so protect, protecting the copyright, protecting the idea um, is not really something to worry too much about. Um, different industries do things differently. Uh, you know, we've, we've all heard movie horror stories. Um, but, uh, in terms, and, and, and even there for the most part, um, you don't own the idea, you know, you own the implementation of it. So that's, that's what I say. Do that. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of people starting out, I think that's what they're most afraid of. Because I remember my mother being terrified when I was like, oh yeah, I'm submitting my story. <gasps> what if they steal your idea? <laughs> and I say, well, then they can take two years and write it. I'm not that worried. You know, so, because the, the idea is honestly kind of the easy part. It's, it's writing the thing that's really the hard work and that's going to, really um, separate everyone out. There's actually a great story about this, that there were two books published in one year about people adrift on lifeboats with tigers. One of them is Life of Pi. The other the one was literally published the same year. They both, as it turned out, the authors did not know each other. They had both read the same article in the New York Times about a guy in a lifeboat with a tiger and they both <laughs> in that story the books are completely different one is a masterpiece one no one's ever really heard of because it kind of sucked apparently i can you know, actually sorry go ahead you know the book no what i was you wrote say, it. it oh i'm sorry peter <laughs> no, they I, can't I, all be I, new york times bestsellers shut up <laughs> <laughs> no i can actually uh i can beat that because i have actually had that exact same situation uh, I mentioned I dabbled in screenplays for a while, and I was actually, you, you can Google this right now, um, I wrote a screenplay called Reality Check, and I actually did very well on different little festivals and film contests and stuff like that with it, and won a lot of money. Um, I won some money, I won screen, uh, like screenplay software, stuff like that. Um, Reality Check, and this might sound familiar, is about the crew of a 1940s serial spaceship who comes to realize they are characters in a TV show and figure out ways to get out. About four or five months after this, after I'd been winning cons and everything, John Scalzi's Red Shirts came out, which oddly enough is about, what you um, there is no, like to the, the very best of my knowledge, John Scalzi and I met out in Phoenix, like for real two years ago. You know, this this was years ago. We never met. And it was, you were both standing at, next to each other at the urinals. Something <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> um, well, my, my point is, we're just two guys who are about the same age, who read a lot of the same books, a lot of the same shows, and came up with a vaguely similar idea. And I wrote a 110-page screenplay with it. He wrote a novel with it. Um, it happens. You know, I actually got deposed once uh, when I used to write for a screenwriting magazine 
because a guy was suing Sylvester Stallone. And I had interviewed Sylvester Stallone over, uh, he had written The Expendables. And then I suddenly got all this legal paperwork from this guy who was suing him, who was convinced Sylvester Stallone stole his idea for The Expendables. Um, I, it just, it, there's a lot of parallel creation and it's honestly just parallel creation. Um, I also think I remember someone telling you this ages ago, and I can't remember who it was, but the people who are most worried about getting their ideas stolen generally have the ideas least worth stealing. So, you know, if, if my big thing is like, no, it's about a bunch of people in a zombie apocalypse who are trying to reach a safe zone. Yeah. I came up with it on my own. <laughs> Along with 10 million other people. Yeah, you know, it's... Who all thought of it first. Yeah. yeah. We, we thought of it first. We, we, we all have ideas. We all copy ideas. And like Stephen said, I mean, right now, if I did a modern take on Dracula, Stephen did a modern take on Dracula, Robin did a modern take on Dracula, Christy did a modern take on Dracula, all of us would be writing very different books. Brennan's Dracula, for example, would be a giant tick. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I write what I know. <laughs> I'm in New England. Ticks are really scary out here. <laughs> but the fact is, none of them would be Salem's Lot, which was Stephen King writing a modern day version of Dracula. So, or, you know, Fred Saberhagen wrote modern day versions of Dracula. It, that was so good. The Saberhagen ones? Yes. And the Dracula tapes is my favorite modern Dracula. I love the Dracula tapes. I love Old Friend of the Family. Old friend of the Hoonies. I don't think I've read either one of those. Oh, I'm gonna really have to. We awesome. gotta do it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, before and we I'll forget, toss it onto the a, pile. Before we <laughs> before we forget though, there's a front half of this question that's about how would you submit work to a publisher? How much should you submit? Okay, that's the easy one to answer. That was, Stephen answered that. That was the brick, right? Mm -hmm. that, that brick was, does it every time. And, and the pictures of the the pets. But yeah. what you do is you go to their website, and everyone has very clear submission guidelines. Oh, God, yes. Follow those yeah. exactly. Yes. If they say they want 50 pages, you send them 50 pages. If they say they want five pages, you send them five pages. If you say, send it to this email address between 5 and 10 p.m. on May the 10th, and you must include the word bunny, you follow those directions. Because <laughs> that is their first way of eliminating people from their slush pile it's who followed our directions it's the kind of what is it the green m&ms guys yeah I, right correct mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's like yeah. did you read our uh direct you know directions if you didn't no we're not going to read the rest of your manuscript we just threw it in the trash and i mean they're they're very straightforward for the most part and they're pretty you know you just say oh okay i'm going to send it to this email address it's going to be 50 pages. They want it attached like this. Okay. That, that's actually the easy part of submission, following the guidelines. All and so many all people screw it up. It's yeah. true. And, and, and no people, you know, Brennan, in no, in no part of that explanation was there follow the agent into the bathroom and slide the manuscript under the stall door. I'm not How many different way? versions of that kidding. story have we all heard? That happens Should so we? often in my master's yeah. program. Agents would come to the master's program to get drunk with teenage, with you know, like college students, because that was very, very strange and very, un, uh, it was not a great idea. Uh, a lot of people got groped. This was before. No. Me. Yeah. It, like, it, we would fight for who got to drive them back to the airport after they spent, after they were completely hung over from, like, drinking a lot and groping people in a very unattractive way. Because we would like slide copies of our short stories in their briefcases. <laughs> this yeah. happened a lot. Yeah, it didn't work. Not a single person I know got published that way. No, it's not there, the there, there is one part of that ideas, like the theft of ideas, that I I want to touch on, and I I think you guys covered it in that we could all get the same idea zombies you know on the moon for example and we would all come up with completely different stories uh with very different characters um 
and, uh, you know, but there are these real world examples um, that I think everybody hears about. Um, and, and you touched on on the, um, the life of Pi one with the tiger on the life raft. Uh, another one that, you know, really just, I think, nails home. You want an agent, you want a good film rights agent who really, really knows the contract uh, language. And just to give you an idea of what can possibly go wrong, uh, was a famous example with the movie Gravity and the novel Gravity uh, yeah. a few years back. And when you, you know, so on the surface, we, we if you read the news articles, we could, but, you know, a summary of it would be, if, you know, if you looked at the news articles and you looked at what people published, um, you know, about the story, what you would see is, oh my gosh, um, you know, Warner Bros. stole the, uh, stole her, her movie rights or something. That's what you see with some of these, these mm -hmm. articles. Yeah. But if you wasn't. actually, it wasn't it, but if you read under, that's, but that's what got the, you know, the clickbait um, rights. If you actually read into the issues that came up, a lot of it came down to contractual issues and how the contracts were written and what happened if they changed property. Mm. So it's a very, very gray, murky, it's not a clear cut and dry thing. Um, so for protecting your IP, get a good agent, get a good film rights agent. Yeah, and yeah, Chrissy's absolutely right. And in terms of, you know, I, I think we all, I shouldn't say that there, there are people who were born way after me, but like the difference between Babylon five and battles and, um, and deep space nine. Yeah. They're both, you know, they're space stations and they've got aliens and there's a wormhole right there. And when you start lining those things up, you're like, my God, but then you look at these shows and they're so different. You know, it's not just about space station plus wormhole plus aliens. There, there's a lot more going on. I mean, one of them had Ivanova. Um, Important point. Five people got that joke who are watching this. But they're so excited and they're feeling, mm -hmm. they're feeling like they're part of this right now. <laughs> I think it's my turn for a question uh yes it is uh let's go through the list um this one is from jessica um how many revisions do you go through before you know your draft is ready to send to an agent or publisher uh personally i think it's a very person it's i think it depends on you um for me i tend to go through about five drafts of something and some of those are questionable drafts in the sense of like my first drafts are super super messy um and I leave like it, it is not unusual to go through one of my first drafts and they'll just be big notes you know like ask Christy about the science on <laughs> um or you know make this sound cool um and then I do a second draft, which actually turns into a readable manuscript. Um, but, you know, I know people who literally do single drafts in the sense of they just go through the same document again and again and again. Um, it will make you feel comfortable without falling into the trap of I'm going to do revisions forever. Um, I know there's a lot of, the, we've all heard that old thing, writing is rewriting. That's true, but to a point and writing I, is also stopping rewriting yes exactly and i think for me i hit like my fifth draft for me like my fifth pass through the whole thing and i kind of think i'm done at this point um and it, you know if an if an agent my agent my editor wants to tell me hey let's work on this cool but for now this is done for me and it's time to move on. So, your mileage may vary. Anyone else? No, I'm good. <laughs> I think it depends a little bit on your method. Um, I know that plotters versus pantsers can have very different numbers of drafts. Um, if you're, a he I'm a heavy uh, plotter, 
where I'm really not going to start writing the book until I really know where I'm going. And I've got like a 20 page treatment of literally all my story beats and that kind of thing. And it's still not going to look exactly the same once I start writing, but I have a real plan. And so I usually only go to one to two drafts before it goes to an agent. And then obviously it'll be going through with the editor again, if it gets accepted. But that's because I've really done that kind of, Oh wait, that doesn't, work that character isn't there yet Ooh, not good oh that's a, i've done that in miniature on my kind of plan through if you're a pantser and you're kind of discovering the story as you go you might run into that on like page 70 and do have to do a major structural rewrite and kind of go through again so some of it i think also depends on technique but it's it's i do think it's a really personal thing uh for every author it's it's kind of a process where do you go now obviously everyone has to you know eventually kind of decide it's enough i've got it as good as i'm going to get it now it's time for other people to read it and to kind of send this thing off and try and find it it's uh it's publishing destiny but yeah i think some of it can also depend on you know technique so that's my thought I, I can speak to it as a pantser. I'm, I'm, I'm a total pantser. Oh, yeah. Um, but I'm kind of a pseudo pantser. So I write the first, I'll write the first chapter. I also write first person narrative. So mm. because I'm writing first person narrative, I'm often putting myself into the head of a character and then I'm writing from their perspective. So what I'll do is I'll come up with the first few chapters and I have an idea of what the story is. And there'll be a bunch of scenes that I want to have. There are sort of my little arc points that bounce, bounce along and I'll go write those, the important ones. Uh, and then I write the ending. Uh, so I know what my ending is going to be. And between that and those scenes that I've kind of flushed out, I'll fill in all the blanks. And that's what takes me a really long time. So I'm not really going without a complete, like I, I've got a, bit of a parachute on there so I at least have points I know I need to make um when and and yeah that comes down to process um when it's time to stop it's when it's interfering with you finishing the novel when you're at the point where you're editing and revising um and you're doing lateral edits so you're not really changing anything. You're just swapping in something maybe different. Or for myself, you know, if I'm, I maybe, I'm not thinking of a better scene. I'm not thinking of a better conflict. I'm just swapping in something else that substitutes. Um, so it's very lateral. And at that point, I'm fiddling, yeah. yeah. And at that point, I'm just doing myself more harm than good. Um, there's no prize for how many edits you do on your manuscript um you know and it's a business you know you want to get your manuscript done and off to your agent so they can sell it um you know if you're only writing a manuscript every seven years then that manuscript has to be really really good if you're trying to make a, a business out of it um you know it's if you get to the point where you're writing a manuscript and you've got something that's pretty readable after a few months We'll then get that out, see what happens, and then, you know, write the next one. So, yeah. yeah. I think we have time for one last question. We, I think we kind of batted around earlier, uh, which is the, the one we're going to go with, because I think we can have the most fun with it, is are you planning on writing a new series? Um, which was originally addressed to Christy, but we can kind of do it for all of us and probably amend it to are you going to continue mm -hmm. your series for – all of us, except Steven, who just got a deal to extend his series. Hey, you're this the best seller. You're, you're, no. you're, you're Mr. Uh, New York Times best seller list, okay? So, yeah. to, and I haven't been drinking either. to cringe. <laughs> <laughs> I've barely been drinking. <laughs> well, you should, you should step it up then. Uh, okay. Well, Christy, since this one was kind of aimed at you, you want to start? I... So I kind of like around. this, yeah, I, I kind of like this question because 
we've all gotten it to a degree. I think any author who's ever done a series has gotten this question and it's, are you continuing the series? Um, and there's an adjunct we can talk about after that, um, an adjunct junct or follow-up question that usually happens. And in my mind, I've been thinking about this actually for the last day or so, and that's, there are really only three reasons why you don't continue a series. And two of the answers to that are kind of exotic. And the other one is, is the usual reason. Um, and so the first exotic reason is that your publisher drops you because you've done something or they perceive you've done something. And that's a very rare scenario. Uh, the second reason is the author decides they don't want to continue that series for whatever reason. And again, that's, that's usually not a set in stone one. I've seen authors who have said, I'm never writing another book, you know, in this series again. And once they've gotten enough money offered, then they're more than happy to continue the series. And that comes down to the reason uh, that the majority of series will either continue or halt. And it ties into the idea that publishing is a business. And is it profitable to do another book in this series for the publisher and the author? And it doesn't mean the book is bad. It doesn't mean the series is bad, but the math is not going to work out. So that's how I, I figured I'd open it. Do you guys have things to add or expand on in that? That was a great opener, Christy. That really I, covers. I think it's 100% yeah. accurate. Amazing. You know, it. <laughs> hey, you got a PhD, Christy. <laughs> Laid out. Dr. Cherish. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I think you laid it out really well. Uh, you know, I've seen, I, I've been lucky, uh, as as Peter pointed out earlier. Um, my Eric Carter series is continuing. I got a, a signed on for three more books, um, which are six, seven, and eight, seven, eight, and nine, or nine. technically eight, nine, and ten, depending on how you look at it. Um, yeah. I did a standalone that takes place in the same, um, uh, in the same world. And that was actually my first book and it has not done great, but uh, <clears throat> that's the one that got me my agent and the series um, and kind of set some things up for the rest of the series. Uh, but yeah, so for this, technically it's nine, nine books uh, is what it will be provided that I don't, you know, die before then. Uh, whether or not there will be more, it's going to come down to the math. Um, and kind of, kind of about that. Um, I, I know what my numbers are and I couldn't say one way or another, if they're considered good or bad, because there's no context. Uh, when you're looking at your sales, you know, you're looking at yours, not looking at them in comparison to anybody else's. And really, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't equate simply because you're talking different authors, different followings, different genres, all sorts of things like that. Um, but the math is done the same way. And I can only assume that I've made enough, that I've made enough money for them that they are allowing me to continue. Um, you know, for the first two, for uh, Dead Things, which is the first book in the Eric Carter series, um, that's done the best. I earned out on that one, but earning out, of course, does not necessarily mean they made a profit. Um, so ultimately, when it comes down to it, I am I know I'm lucky. Uh, I don't have a good grasp on what it, what my sales are in, like I was saying, there's no context. So in the, in the larger environment, you know, I have no idea, but they are, they, at the beginning, they gave me the time to screw up. They, they allowed me enough leeway to, uh, they gave me enough rope to hang myself if I was going to do it. And to that, for that, I, I'm very grateful to my publisher 
because I think that there are a lot of series that get set up, that get uh, sold, and, oh, your, your first book numbers didn't do very well. Uh, we're not going to continue. So you end up like a, you know, a one and a two, and that's it. And you have, you have people who've been reading these and go, okay, what, what about the next one? Eh, well, you know, you got to talk to those people or get a bunch of other people to buy a bunch of these previous books and then maybe we'll have a conversation. But that rarely happens. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I've, I've been lucky and uh, we'll see how much, we'll see how long it lasts. You know, if I can get past nine books, um, maybe I'll get sick of it and walk away. Uh, maybe they'll go, eh, your, your numbers are in the, in the shitter, so no. Uh, but who knows? And I'm talking way too much, so I'm going to let somebody else talk. Stephen said, um, it, it is very true that um, first books, uh, this is what my editor told me uh, when we were having these conversations. Uh, Stephen, I think you and I had our first books come around, uh, Dead Things came out around the time. Yeah, around the same day, time. Right? Mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're in kind of this similar, um, yeah. like, graduating class or whatever we call it. Uh, but yeah, they, they came around, out around the same time. I also considered myself very lucky. They bought the first, they bought three. So they definitely, they wanted to give this, the series time to kind of find its legs in the Gen V series. And unfortunately, really never happened um, with my series. Um, I was lucky. I did earn out on the first one as well. But it was, again, one of those things that you see your numbers in kind of this, like, little box. And they don't say, well, here's you compared to here, compared to here. You don't get the context on the numbers. But I knew, you know, they were pretty clear, pretty fast that, they were not seeing the kind of numbers they wanted to see from this urban fantasy series. They, they really, you know, they tried to give the series time to stretch. They gave it a fourth book, which was just a, a gift at that point. I had planned six, but even getting that fourth allowed me to tie up a lot of things when I realized, okay, there is probably not going to be in the five and six. I can do some things, though, in four that give a little bit of closure to the people who are following this series. But it is one of those interesting things that this is what my editor said that whether you have three books or 17 books, your sales will never be as good on the later books as they were on number one. Number one is always going to be your biggest best seller because someone mm. who sees book 17 come out, they're like, Oh, maybe I should try this. I'm going to pick up number one. So you'll keep getting those sales on number one and number one can just become that sometimes they'll even order a book like in a big long crazy series to get more money off of number one is what she said which i thought was a really cool thing to learn from a marketing perspective and you know they're looking at these numbers i mean they don't buy someone's book because they want it to fail they buy someone's book because they want it to work and they want it to have legs and earn them a whole lot of money because that makes literally everyone in the equation gets really happy yeah <laughs> you know? it's yeah. a business exactly it's a business and when the book sells well literally everyone wins in that you know setup uh the series a series dying early can be you know, obviously it was very sad i mean i feel still feel lucky i got four books i got to write four books it's still so cool um, the question you get a lot is, are you going to self-pub? Because I do have the outlines of five and six. Are you going to mm -hmm. self-pub five and six? Well, for me, the answer is no on that one. Because first of all, I have seen my sales numbers. And I know how well the, that book did from a major publisher in print with all the wonderful stuff that comes with a traditional publisher. Artwork and a real editor and copy editing and page proofing and a beautiful book and, and, as, and actual marketing right and actual marketing um and i know that okay here are my numbers with all those good things so i can only imagine that my sales numbers self-pub would be a tiny fraction of that and that's with me footing the bill on all of it so writing the book with no advance and having to pay someone to do the editing and having to pay someone to do the artwork if I want it to actually look decent and having to pay somebody to copy it. Because I mean, yeah, 
I need an editor and a copy editor. Those things are what, in, in a lot of ways, make the book finally look professional and be a professional. None of my first drafts, you know, were what went to pub. You know, they were always better books with the inclusion of an editor's work and a copy editor's work and all the other people who were involved. So looking at that and the kind of money I'd have, to, I'd have to put money in, I'm not sure I would get that, you know, I would even break even on that. Whereas if I put my energy into a whole new series, I could potentially get new advances. Uh, I could get more attention for, you know, for myself. And if I, obviously, if a book did really, really well, someone might come along and say, hey, we like money. Do you have five and six on that Gen V series? Can you, can you do that? Because suddenly your name is selling a lot. We like money. Let, can you make us more money? You know, so I, it's one of the things that when you look, if you're someone who likes things that come with a traditional publishing system, to, you know, and I'm one of those people who likes the traditional publishing system. I mean, self-pub has its applications without a doubt. And it has people who work well within that system, but I work well in the traditional publishing system. So for me, a new series is what kind of makes sense. So that's where I've been putting my energies lately on kind of creating a new series that's you know, very fun to work on in the time that I have to work on stuff. And I just think it's a better use. You know, we all have very finite amounts of writing energy we've got here. And so put it, for me, putting the, that energy into something that could sell and could have a whole new start and bring fresh eyes and also be something really fun as opposed to something that got kicked around a lot and had a really kind of scrappy time of it. You know, it might not be vampires, but still could be fun. So. I, I think that's a, a good point you brought up about the time. Uh, just because one thing to consider is that if you're going to self-publish it, that's working on that is time you're not working on something else. So it's not even just that I'm going to work on it and, you know, to feel very comfortable and that I feel this is the best it can be. But during that five months, you could have written something that someone will pay you a lot of money up front for, you know, and, and I don't mean that to sound mercenary, like I just want the money. Yeah, um, I think although money is really nice and it pays for hmm? yeah I think that is kind I'm of one of those di yeah it's one of those differences I think between are you you know is writing your passion project versus is writing something you love but are also trying to make a living at and well, those, those, are those are different yeah. those are different things those are different stances yeah, there's, there's kind of that aspect too of, you know, when you start seeing some of these um, self-published self-published authors who have done really, really well, mm. a lot of them you can trace back either they or somebody they know very well and is close to them have a very significant sales and marketing background. Yes, and they're spending. You know, it comes down to that time thing again. They're spending. 50 to 80% of their working hours, not writing, but doing the marketing and the advertising to go with it. Um, and I, and I've run into the same thing, same thing as you, uh, where I, yourself, Brian, where I am not, I want to write something new, knowing how much work and effort goes into the editing and the publishing and the marketing and the advertising and the upfront cash that the publisher puts up that yeah. goes into all of that besides the events that they give me yeah. you are the publisher you are if you're self-publishing you've got to put up all that money and you may never see it back again um yeah. you know so if you've got a marketing background from publishing then yes self-publishing might be the great place for you to go because you've been doing that for five or ten years and and know the business inside out but yeah, it's, it's just not, I, I would rather work on a new art project. And the other thing too, is that just because of, and I, I get this question too, with leaving, um, I, I t I'm very bad, I'll tie off some things, but I also leave things open in my last books. And the reason is, is that there is, 
not to be mercenary, but there is no benefit to me as the writer and the artist tying off a series that I may not be finished with because there are all sorts of other rights that, um, you know, that, pe that my, my agents are working on all the time. There are film rights, there are TV rights potential. There's foreign rights. There's always the possibility that your book has a resurgence years later um, and people become interested in it. So yeah, it's, there's, um, you know, there's always the potential, but you know, you can always work on something new. Yeah. I think that's one of the fun things too about writing as opposed to like, okay, let's, you know, you can always come back and pick it up and the characters are right there where you left them. They have an age. It's not like a TV series where you're just like, I'm sorry, you can't pick up and make Firefly again. The actors got a little old and they're not going to fit in those costumes anymore. Yeah. Um, it's, just, it's just the same thing. And if you tie it up to try and tie it too tightly actually it's really cool i just read the new ann bishop she wrote a new her black jewel series dark jewel series which is it's an amazing series but she did it and then she a couple years back did a short story collection where she kind of tied things off even tighter than she had at the end of the original series and then like a, a period of time passed and she clearly decided you know either she got interested in it or someone offered her like a boatload of cash maybe both it's a great series it sold really well and ann bishop's an amazing writer so she has just released a book that's clear it's a return to the world it's picking up the characters and you can in the first bit of that book you can see her kind of like oh gotta untie some of these knots a little bit got it because she's having to she's picking up and she's going in a new direction but she tied it so tight in the last book that you can see her unweaving just a little it's a good book but it, it, it's kind of interesting from that perspective that you could see from that last one, she didn't expect to go back. I don't know Anne Bishop. <laughs> Caveat, I don't know Anne Bishop, I'm guessing. But it looked to me like at the end of that last book, she tied it really tight. She clearly didn't think she wanted to go back. And then she kind of said, wait, if I do this, and then you can see her like, gotta undo just a bit of this. Um, did, did I not another... mention Jerry was here too? <laughs> I think that's a, a good point. Um, one thing I see a lot, I don't know about all of you, is who's, have you ever gotten that whole comment of like, well, I'll read it when the series is done. Oh, oh, I don't yeah. want to see a series in case you don't finish it. Yeah. Um, which I've tried explaining to people, like, I, that's not the kind of series I'm writing. And they don't seem to grasp that, that, you know, I'm, I'm just writing books that involve the same characters. It's not like I have some 14 book master plan that, you know, we're going to get to the end and find the big lever that lets you shut off the zombie apocalypse or something. Um, I don't know if you've ever dealt with that. And I try explaining to people again, like we're, like you were saying, Robin, you, you have to buy the books. If you don't buy the books, they're not going to pay for later books. Yeah. And if they're not paying for later books, I will write something else because this is how I make a living. So. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of a bummer to have to explain to people that, listen, okay, I understand in a reading perspective that you might hate the feeling of getting cliffhangered and never getting to see the end of it. That, that does suck. But at the same time, if you take that stance that I only read completed series, that's another series that might never get its completion because mm -hmm. as the books are coming out, the publishers are keeping really close eyes on that number. And if it doesn't do what they're hoping, they will cut the cord on that series. And it might not get, I don't know, the 10 books or even the six or the eight that it might have gotten to kind of go to its full conclusion very few people really There's, roll in with this is a set you know three books it's done at the end of three no more no less and you know for the publishers to go yeah sure absolutely i'll buy it all in one it's the complete series and it's never you know that's all there is a lot of us tend to be i, I don't think anyone 
I think I don't, I don't, I don't think I know any first time author except Christy probably who walked in and just said, I have a four book series that I want to sell. Like, I think it's really tough as a first time author to sell a series. You can and probably I sell. I did it. You sold a book with series potential. Yes. Same, same yeah. with me. Yeah. Same, right. same here. Which, I had the first book yeah. written and they were, I had the first book written. I was happy with it. Uh, and in the, you know, in the conversation that you have with the publisher when they're like, Ooh, we like this. And you're saying, yes, you do. Um, my, the person, the woman who became my editor and so it's, she in an email said, so we're really interested if you have a series, we don't want just a single standalone book. We want a series. And the and answer I is always thought, yes. And yeah. exactly. I said, absolutely. This is a three book series. And she said, that's wonderful. Can you get me uh, specs for book two and three on Monday? And I said, absolutely I can. And that was a very frantic weekend. Because I had not it's, thought at all of it. But I wrote those specs over the weekend. And, and I didn't people, sleep for 72 hours. <laughs> I, I didn't. But what's hysterical <laughs> is that's basically the two and three book that ended up happening. I was on fire that weekend. <laughs> but they I saw had, the specs. They saw the specs and they're like, oh, yes, yes, we will buy that. And, and then I got paid for three books, which was even better. It's kind of like that date question oh, or, you know, when you're meeting roommates and, mm -hmm. you know, they ask, so, you know, do you, do you like to clean? Do you do dishes? Are you okay with that? And you're like, yes, absolutely. yes, mm -hmm. I absolutely. Exactly. Or when you're in an interview and they say, what's your, you know, what's the trait that you are most ashamed of? I'm such a hard worker. You know, I mean, it's really. I don't know when to <laughs> I never I, I don't sleep. I just I, I just work type all the time. time. I work on my own time. I mean, it's just it's really impeding with other things, but I just love to work so much. It's true. <laughs> I had uh in all fairness, we are not advocating to lie to agents or editors. Just to be clear. <laughs> no, you just, you just massage the truth slightly. A little bit, you know. I, I had a I had a similar situation. The uh, uh, the book that I sold uh, got me a three book uh, deal, and the the idea for the series wasn't what ended up happening. It was okay. This book we're in this world following this character. Now we're in the same world following this other character and how they interact and cross and so on. And they, uh, they thought, Oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And then I turned in dead things and I get this email, uh, from, from my editor saying, Hey, could we change the, the series idea and just kind of like follow this guy and I went, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and well, then, great, what's, to do all what's the next book? <laughs> I said, I will get that information right over to you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know, it happens. You, I, I, I think when you're, when you're starting, uh, when you're having those conversations, you don't know where they're going to end up. Uh, and you just kind of have to roll with it. And if you really, really don't want to do a series and you've been asked, hey, can you make this as a series? okay you know there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that um for me i wanted to continue writing and i wanted to continue writing in that world so i lucked out yeah i mean the the thing we do have to also emphasize is that this isn't a one-way street where they you know i mean i just watched a you know a documentary on hedy lamar and that old uh hollywood system so it's not like you know, it's not like they can just tell you, oh, you're going to do this now and we're going to change your name and you're going to do all this X, Y, and Z. You know, it, it, it's not like that. These are all kind of, these are all conversations where people are saying, we want this and you get to decide, do I also want to do this? Now, obviously you have an incentive as a young author to say yes a lot, but you don't have to say yes. I mean, there were times even in the editing of the first book where my editor asked me for something and I thought about what she was asking me and there were kind of times where I said no I'm not going to make that change to the book but I see the issue you're raising and so I can address it in x y and z and those were and those often led me in good story paths 
where I said, okay, I see what she's saying. I don't want to do the thing she's suggesting as a fix, but I can address what I recognize she's actually brought up to my attention, that there is this kind of thing she's recognizing as a problem. I'm just going to resolve it in a way that works better with what my plan for this book is. And that's part of the kind of conversation. And there's a little bit of a give and take between you and an editor, you know, when you're working together. And also sometimes even with you as a, in a publisher, where the publisher might be saying, um, can you make it more this? And sometimes the answer is, it's really not, it's really not what that is. Can we do it like this or that? So there is, there is, it's a relationship like anything else, you know. We're, we're just all telling some very funny stories of when we all just jumped and said, sure, absolutely, I can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> but not always. But I'm sure I we all have equal amounts of stories where we were like, no, I'm not going to do that, but I can talk about other things. Or maybe what if I do something else that you like even better? One, one of the first things I ran into with urban fantasy with my first series was... Um, uh, one of the first questions my publisher gave me was I was doing more of an adventure um, style urban fantasy and I didn't have the romantic arcs that urban fantasy at the time back in 2014 mm. was really you know quite full of um, and you know it wasn't really ever asked me oh can you know toss in a few sex scenes but it was kind of hinted at in that direction you know it was asked oh there isn't any of this in this book and we if just had to go to yeah in. yeah <laughs> yeah you know if you if you guys are going to insist on it you know but we just sort of said yeah it's not there and it never went any further so i i was kind of happy about that but there would have been a there could have been a point where they would have said yeah this needs to have our marketers say this needs to have x scene in it and as a young author, you know, I probably would have been in the, put in the position of, or an earlier author, um, early career author, not younger, earlier career. No, um, Christy, you're still a young ingenue. We know the truth. <laughs> but um, I would have, I, you know, I would have had to have said, yeah, okay, you know, is this something I really want to stick my feet in about? Is this a real issue for me? Or do I... We lost your audio, Christy. Yeah, we, yeah. Okay, it wasn't just me that couldn't hear. It. All oopsies. No, no, but we got heard. you up till up till what you stick your feet in. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure go. I want to know what you stick your can feet. Can you hear in. me now? Yes, we can hear you yes, now. Yes, yes, we okay. can. Okay. My it's headphones. Um, clue, though, I think we are running really close to our time. Put earphones so, now, so I can hear you. But um, yeah, give them two seconds to recharge. Yeah, but yeah, I that's actually, where I was going to leave it. Yeah. I, was, I got that about the first book in my series, too. They were like, Could it, is there going to be some romance? And I, you know, I, yeah. I actually did talk it over with my editor because the, the dynamic was in the first book, it's much more friendship. In the second and third, it ended up kind of being more that. But that was actually a conversation with my editor where she was kind of saying, you know, she wasn't pushing me. She was saying, I see it like this. And I kind of looked and said, oh, I see what you see. Huh, mm -hmm. I can do that. Now, obviously, Stephen did hot sex scenes with a skeleton, which is why he's got nine books. Yeah. Yeah. So we know how I wish Stephen decided that. I had, actually. Uh, the, the situation you I ran into. Meeting the phrase boning. Yeah, boning, exactly. Uh, the situation I ran into <laughs> was uh, in Dead Things. Uh, my editor looked at it and, and emails me and says, you know, there aren't a lot of women in this. And I looked at it and went, you're right. Okay. And so I went, all right. And I took a side character and I kind of, you know, wove over further into the story and she's become a key character throughout the series. Uh, and now I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at some of the other, books after that I, mean, I think i took it to heart so much that i think in i think in the last one that i just turned in besides eric carter there aren't any men in it so I, that's that's the thing i have to look at um, just embrace the matriarchy steven 
It's cool. Yeah. Oh, always. <laughs> Have been forever. <laughs> All right. We should we should wind this up so WonderCon doesn't cut us off. Not that we don't think WonderCon would do that because we love WonderCon. Um, so anyone, where, where can everyone be found if people liked what you said here? Where can they find you, Christy? They can find me on Facebook uh, by just searching for Christy Cherish, C-H-A-R-I-S-H. On Twitter, um, uh, at Christy Cherish. Uh, and uh, you can, if you uh, follow Peter, uh, often you'll see me, uh, well, or Stephen and... Um, uh, Brennan, you'll see us all, uh, you know, tweeting back and forth occasionally. So, um, uh, and on my website, christycherish.com. So, yeah, a few places. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go. Uh, usually a, a ditch down by the tracks, I can be found. Uh, my, my website is, uh, boringly, stephenblackmore.com. On Twitter, I'm uh, S Blackmore. Uh, should be fairly easy, but it is two O's, and a lot of people seem to screw that up, uh, which means that I'm also confused with the royal botanist of the UK, Stephen Blackmore, with one O. That was the most amazing day on Twitter when we all realized that. That was, oh, I, I, I loved it. It was a disappointment for me, I have to say. I, Sexual mor dimorphism in flowering plants. I wrote that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, mostly I, you can you can find me on Twitter. Uh, and that's, I think, it. Yeah. I also have a boring webpage, uh, mlbrennan.com. Uh, and yeah, I am most active on Twitter these days. I have a Facebook account, but I don't do it as much. Okay. Um, so, uh, my Twitter handle is confusingly at Brennan ML because ML Brennan was taken when I had to set all this up like a couple months before my book launched. So that's why it's a little confusing. But yeah, I'm, I, I do, I'm, uh, mostly on Twitter and I mostly, if you follow any of these other three, you will eventually see a lot of annoying comments from me. A lot. Too many. Uh, so many I'm Peter, uh, I'm Peter Kleins. Um, Peter Kleins on Twitter, at Peter Kleins. On Instagram, at Peter Kleins. I also have the boring website, peterkleins.com, um, which is so boring. I don't think I've done anything with it for ages. It auto reposts like updates to my writing blog, and that's it. Um, so I think that's everything. So where, where is your writing blog? My writing blog is actually an old uh, Blogspot blog. And I'm, I, like we've been talking about, I'm so lazy. I actually have never migrated it anywhere, which I really need to do. Um, but it is so freaking old. It had like a stupid name. I did not have any sort of real writing career when I started it. Uh, so it's actually Writer on Writing. Uh, if you search for Peter Klein's Writer on Writing, you'll find it. The actual address is uh, thothammon.com, uh, just because Thoth was the Egyptian god of writing. So you can try that, but really just look for You were really writing. young when you did that, yeah. We're not going to talk about it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all watching this who have come to the our virtual Writer's Coffee House. I hope you got something out of it and found us semi-educational, if not semi-entertaining. Um, and I think that's it. Wash your hands. Stay safe. Goodbye.